Lisa joining us now. And Lisa, I want to start with the Sarah Fuller story. Really interested in your perspective. You're a two-sport athlete yourself. You play basketball and soccer at Northwestern. What did it mean to you to see Sarah Fuller out on the field? I was inspired by it, but Dave, I, I think the important thing to note here is is not necessarily what it meant to me, but some of the reactions that I saw from some of the men in the country. You know, of course, I'm going across social media and, and I'm seeing the support from people like myself and other women supporting Sarah Fuller in that position. But here's the, here's the situation. Much like in, in racial struggles, in gender struggles, we also need gender allies. And so when I'm going on social media, Dave, and, and I'm seeing a tweet from LeBron James, or I'm seeing a tweet from Dak Prescott, or I'm hearing Georgia head coach Kirby Smart talk about how his daughters were impacted by that, to me, it was more impactful to see the group of people who weren't marginalized to have a voice. And, and so I, I'm just curious, when, when I look at, at this panel and this discussion, there's one head coach here. And, and Jerry DiNardo, you were a head coach at, at LSU and Indiana and, and Vanderbilt. I, I'm curious, how would you have handled a situation if, if you needed a, a, a substitute for a kicker and there was a women's soccer player available? Lisa, I think it starts with bringing gender and, and race issues to the game. I don't think the game brings it to you. So I, I have been a very liberal person in, in all of my politics. I have been around very strong women. I, I, have, I have many men friends that have very strong support that a woman can do anything, obviously, as good as a man. So how would I have reacted back at Vanderbilt? I mean, that was 30 years ago. I mean, I hope I would say that if she can kick, she can kick. It doesn't really, nothing else really matters. And, and so that's been my attitude. And again, we, we bring the issue to the game. The game doesn't bring the issue to us. That's that's how I have always dealt with these type of issues, Howard. You know, one of the things that's always been fascinating, particularly when you think about what happened uh, at Vanderbilt, is, is the fact that, Lisa, you mentioned it, you talked about all the these superstar athletes that have come out and, and come out in support, and I think that is great, but I think it's even better when the everyday dad and the everyday brother come out and have something to say and are supportive, and, and a lot of the friends that I talked to that I have were excited to see her get that opportunity because it was well-deserved, and it was a perfect executed pooch kick that worked perfectly and I thought she should have gotten a lot of credit for it and she did yeah absolutely and it's 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 interesting when I watch it too because I'm I'm so close to my playing days and I'm thinking about what that would have been like in the locker room and just that experience and I think all of our players would have accepted her just because she's good at what she does and it's so weird that we expected you know like everybody was like oh if she can't kick it out the back of the end zone then she doesn't deserve to be there and I can't imagine the amount of times I mean, we watch a ton of football and see how bad some of the college kickers are and for us to have that expectation of Sarah Fuller just because she's an outsider in a certain space is really weird but you could see that the players were excited and she really brought some juice and some leadership to that locker room, too. Just looking at her interviews afterwards, she was definitely invested in what she was doing. I'm with well, Howard, I'll actually, I'm sorry, Dave, if I wanted to cut in and, and comment on what Howard said. You know, she did get that support for what she was able to do. But also, if you searched Sarah Fuller on Twitter, there was a lot of criticism. It was a publicity son. It was just a squib kick. And, and that's part of the problem that I see when women are starting to enter into worlds where we don't necessarily always see women in, in these different environments. Dave, let me ask you, how long have you played football? <laughs> I'm sorry, someone was in my ear. Say that again, Lisa. I said, Dave, how long have you played football? <laughs> yeah, no, I haven't <laughs> played at all. And, and I'm totally with you on this. I know exactly where you're going on this. And so let's transition to broadcasters because I'm fascinated by this portion of it. Yeah, I haven't played football and no one bats an eye when I sit here and host a college football show. And I think you could go across America and you go to the lead play-by-play -play voices, you go to the lead studio hosts, and almost none of them played football at any kind of a high level. And yet no one bats an eye. But what's the reaction to you, Lisa, when you're, let's say, calling a football game? 
well, suddenly it becomes really important. Whereas for you, Dave, as, as a studio host for uh, a football show, as a play-by-play -play, uh, for a football game, it doesn't matter that you haven't played football, but suddenly it matters for me as a play-by-play. -play, how much football has she played? Let me, let me flip it, the argument, and, and let you know that I have played zero years of volleyball. And I am asked zero times about my volleyball experience as a volleyball play-by-play. -play. So my point of bringing up that issue is the measuring stick still to this day when we measure women versus men when it comes to broadcasting and sports, an inch on the ruler looks like this for men, an inch for women looks like this because we suddenly have to hit so many different criteria than what men have to do. Lisa, I think the issue is also the, the, the people that think that you can't do play-by-play -play football as good as Reverend when neither one of you played the game are the same people that don't think you could be a CEO of a Fortune 500 company because you're a woman and not a man. Again, we bring our biases to the game. The game just reveals our biases. And, and so I think you are correct and you are subject to that bias. And it's not only in sports, it's, it's the entire country has that attitude. Now, is it getting better? I think we could have a discussion about that. But anybody could learn how to do play-by-play -play in football, certainly someone who's never played the game regardless of gender. Yeah, I think one of the other things that's an issue, uh, and Lisa, you host shows, you call games, but when they want to refer to you, particularly the guys that have those uh, Twitter fingers, <laughs> it's a sideline reporter. And they forget the fact that you host shows. They forget the fact that you call in the lead broadcaster for football games and basketball games. They don't want to, and it's just not you. Maria Taylor goes through the same thing over at ESPN. And it's unbelievable how people treat women in sports because they're talking about something that they're passionate about. Yeah, you may love football, and you're telling me because it's a female voice giving you your information, you don't love it anymore. In a lot of areas, you're much better than a lot of the men because of your process, the way you go through you, uh, getting prepared for these games and your insight. Those are the, all the things that make you who you are, and I think people need to open up to that. Yeah, Howard, and I'll, I'll just piggyback off of that. I think it's how, how women have to navigate in this space that I have a ton of respect for. And I've talked to uh, Nicole Auerbach specifically about some of these issues, and she tells me when she's trying to get scoop from a player or she wants to do an interview, it's even something as benign as how she asks for a phone number that she has to be concerned with because she doesn't want to come across the wrong way. She can't spend time in Indianapolis around the combine at 2 a.m. at the bar like you know the, the male reporters do because it, it just doesn't look right. They get criticized for what you wear and how you present, and it's just stuff we don't have to go through. Like I watch some of these male broadcasts and they look sloppy and nobody <laughs> talks about how sloppy they look but a woman comes on television wearing something that somebody doesn't think she should be wearing and all of a sudden it's a trending topic on Twitter and I, I just I have a ton of respect and appreciation for anybody who's an outsider trying to navigate in a certain space where many people don't operate because of all the things you have to go through and then to show up and still be successful and great at what you do it's admirable. Yeah, you know, one, I mean, you mentioned the objectification, and again, that happens across all aspects of society, as, as Jerry talked about. You were talking about specifically in that play-by-play -play role, though, in football, and for me, Lisa, it's really personal, not just knowing you and seeing what you've been through, but when I was at ESPN, I shared a cubicle with Pam Ward, who was the first woman to have a national platform calling play-by-play, -play. and honestly, people were brutal on her, and that was before social media, but there was a website that was right. devoted to the things that Pam did wrong, and it it was crushing. It was crushing to see. First of all, I think she's really good. Second of all, I know how hard she worked, but it wasn't about her work or how well she did or did do. It was about people feeling threatened and feeling that somehow, in some strange sort of way, they were being encroached on. And I'm not talking about broadcasters. I'm talking about people who aren't even in the industry feeling like somehow this was invasive into their world. So I want to leave it with this. How much has that impacted you and how does that change? Every opportunity that is out there from the Pam Wards to the Beth Moens to the women that you highlighted at the beginning of the segment in, in all different categories of sports, here's the deal. We need to start normalizing 
the marginalized. And what I mean by that, where do we go from here? We need to look for opportunities where there haven't been opportunities before. It was back in 2014 when Greg Popovich hired Becky Hammond as an assistant coach. And when I first saw that story, I read every single word of that story. And I think the NBA has taken a lead in terms of opening up some opportunities for women to be leaders in that league and in that sport. So now when I see another female hire in the NBA, I'm skimming the story. It's my hope that we sometimes go from reading every single word of a story to skimming the story to finally losing the headline. Here's my hope eventually for if we're just talking about female broadcasters in football. My hope is that one day a female voice on a football game becomes background noise. And what I mean by that is think about how many times you've had a game on with a second screen or you're doing something else. And not once do you think about who the announcer is. And I am guilty as the, of this as anyone. When there is a female voice on a football game, I stop what I'm doing and I try to figure out who it is. And I hope that one day, it's not going to be this year, it's not going to be next year, it's probably not going to be in five years, but maybe in 10 years down the line, uh, your daughters, Dave, and, and the people who are watching and the dads that are watching, maybe someday we will watch a football game with the female voice being the lead voice as a play-by-play -play and not think twice about it. Well, we'll leave it on that. And as you know, I have three daughters who are crazy about sports, and one of them in particular considers you to be among her heroes, as I have told you many times. So, Lisa, keep up the great work. I'm sorry we won't be able to hear you today. COVID strikes again, but we'll look forward to some hoops <laughs> tomorrow. Michigan State and Oakland over on FS1. Lisa Byington, great stuff.